Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. I have reasons to believe that the Exodus was took place in the year 1476 BC. 1476. If you add those BC years, 1476 to our current year, 2024, you get 3,500, 3,500. Now, if you took a Jubilee and you multiplied it times 70, 50 times 70, that's 3,500. I have every reason to believe that 2024 will end 70 jubilees now we've been online here now for going on eight years we've covered a lot of subjects many of it uh, prophetic i can't help but believe and i continue to believe that we're looking at nearly six thousand years since creation nearly 77 since israel was reborn 70 jubilees since the exodus and roughly 2,000 years since cavalry cavalry uh calvary i'm sorry not cavalry calvary the death burial and resurrection of our lord and savior jesus christ i do believe that those numbers are significant I can't help but believe that these numbers are unprecedented. And so there's every reason to believe that the rapture is near. Just wanted to say that up front before we get into our text this morning. We've been studying together in the epistle to the Galatians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were somewhere in the area of uh, verse 6 or verse 7. I believe that uh, I covered in the last video up to verse 6 of chapter 4. So we're looking at verse 7, and I'd like to take this time, I'd like to spend this time talking to you folks about this one verse. I'm going to devote the entire message to one verse. One verse. One of the reasons that I find it of great interest is because we are looking at the near return of our Lord, and it mentions our being an heir of God through Jesus Christ. And typically, when people think of that, uh, our inheritance, uh, I think the average Christian would probably look, look at that verse or look at that word inheritance and think of the future, well, that's heaven. That's, you know, that's our inheritance. I think it includes heaven. I think it includes everything that beyond heaven that continues on throughout all of eternity. But I'm also going to suggest that it means things present. That our inheritance includes, first and foremost, our re being redeemed our redemption, uh, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, uh, identified with Christ, baptized into the body, uh, receiving of His Spirit, uh, where His Spirit within us cries, Abba, Father. There's, there's a whole lot to the word inheritance, and it, I believe the word, the fact that we are heirs through Christ, that encompasses a whole lot, more than I could ever present in a single video. Verse 7 says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, a servant, but a son. And if a son, and that's a first class condition, since you are a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That's our verse. Wherefore, uh, wherefore, that is in consequence of, of this privilege of addressing God our Father, Abba, Father, 
The word Abba means father. And then father, so it's father, father. Thou art no more. That is, you who are Christians. He's not speaking to non-believers. It's speaking of you and I. A servant. I hope to be able to address that word adequately. A servant. No longer a servant. That is, in the servitude of sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. Or treated as a servant. It's not how God treats us. By being bound under the oppressive rules and regulations and, and, and uh, rites uh, and ceremonies of the law. That is no longer. Galatians 4, three. If we back up a few verses, even so we, when we were children, children, were in the bondage, were in bondage under the elements of the world. And I've tried to define world as primarily the way that it's used in Scripture is the world religious system based on human merit as opposed to wearing lipstick and high-heeled shoes or whatever you want to define the world as. It is a religious context. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Think Israel, because Israel's going to come into this. Keep in mind that these early Christians that Paul is writing to were primarily Jewish Christians. They fully understood the law of Moses. They fully understood the traditions of their fathers. They fully understood the religious system of their day. We have died to sin, self, the law, the world. According to Scripture, we've died to six things. Sin, self, the law, or law, not articulated, just law, the world, Satan, and death. Six things that we've died to. We died to those because we were identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. There's been a change of status. There's been a change of position. We're no longer, in, as Gentiles today, the application to us today, is nonetheless, it's the same as it was with these early Jewish Christians. We were in bondage unto the elements of the world. Before we came to realize the full sufficiency of His, of His sacrifice on our behalf, that He died a substitutionary death, that He was our kinsman redeemer, that He redeemed us, He bought us, purchased us out of the marketplace, never to be sold again, that we are a prized possession of, of Him. We are a son, a son. We're no longer children. We're adult, mature sons, a child of God, adopted into his family, adopted. And I, uh, I shared with you my view on that, the word adoption, how I believe that it's, you can almost use that word as a synonym for being born again, born from above by the will of God, not the will of the flesh, that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. So we are a child of God. We are adopted into His family and to be treated as a son. And so I want to take you back in time a little bit. I want to try to paint a picture here. I probably won't do a very good job of this. I'm not a Jew, obviously. I'm an Oki, but I'm not from Muskogee. No offense to you people out, out, if any of you were watching and you're from Muskogee, my apologies for that. I don't mean to offend you in any way. A child of God adopted into his family and to be treated as a son. And if a son were entitled, 
It's not like you, you know, you, you have to earn these entitlements or whatever you are entitled to all the privileges of, of a son. Why? Because you're a son, not because of anything you did. And of course, to be regarded as an heir through the Redeemer and with Him. With Him. If you would turn with me to Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 12. I'd like to read this. Therefore, beginning at verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Debtors. Here's our obligation. If you're a Christian and you're looking for, an, for respond, that some area of, of, of understanding concerning your responsibility as a Christian, this is it. We are debtors, not to the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. To live after the flesh. To walk according to the flesh. And when we see the word flesh mentioned in Scripture, it is inseparably connected with the whole concept of law keeping as a rule of life. That's what the flesh does. We're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And I don't think that that word live is referring to heaven when we die. It's talking about life now. It's a present tense. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the Holy Spirit is leading us as His children. If you're a child of God, you cannot say that we have to do something somehow or the other to be led by the Spirit of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Okay. Now keep in mind, keep in the back of your mind Israel here. Israel, given the law, redeemed out of Egypt. God's people. God redeemed His people, Israel. Out of, he brought them out of bondage. We're looking at a verse in which it's talking to Gentiles. Jew and Gentile alike, one body in Christ. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He's our Father. Now, without launching into a long, long sermon about the word Father, it should be apparent in your thinking that when it comes to a father and son relationship, we did not become a, his, our father's son because of some choice that we made. It's not, that's not the way it is in real life. It's not the way it is in our spiritual life. We are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, since, another first class condition, since it, it, it is that we suffer with Him, you're going to suffer with Him. That's a whole separate topic in and of itself. How, you know, how do we suffer as His sons and join heirs with Christ? If, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I started out by mentioning what, uh, giving you a, just a, a few scant reasons why I believe that we are nearing the end of the age. We are looking, we, we have in front of us in, in very real time, we, we have in, right in front of our eyes, we have to look forward to our in inheritance. I believe you could, you could actually, it wouldn't be anything wrong with saying that that inheritance includes the rapture of the church. It certainly includes the sufferings. It certainly includes everything that Christ has done to redeem us choosing us a people out for Himself. Just like He chose a nation, He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He sanctified us. 
set us apart for service. We had no part in this at all. It was all by grace. Think the prodigal son. You know, he was always a son. Okay, he didn't lose his sonship when he went off in the far country and squandered, wasted his inheritance. Today, you and I, either one of us, as believers in Christ, can live our lives wherever we're at, consider it going off into a far country, apart from Christ, squandering our inheritance. The, the blessings that we have received from Christ little recognized. We don't even under... We're even struggling with the idea that we are somehow... We, we could be... How, how we could be even, even be God's son. Well, Steve, you don't know how I live. If you just knew how I live. The prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, it's, it's a classic example. It fits right into our text here. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant. That, that is a benefit, folks, that is result that results from adoption, new birth, that we are no more a servant. We were called out to be separate from that world system, that, that religious system based on human merit. In a natural state, we were the servants of sin. That's what we were. And of course, when we talk about sin, we can't help but, but talk about law because the strength of sin is the law. Slaves to the world. And the lusts of it. The lusts of it. And again, I do not believe that's playing golf on Sunday. I do not believe that that's going to movies. I do not believe that that's wearing lipstick or whatever. And in bondage to the law. Bondage to the law. The law was never given to the church. Ever wasn't even given to the church, and yet the church today, in the main, modern Christianity, it's all about law. That legalism, the early legalism that we see in our study here in Galatians that crept into the church early, has remained to this day. And not only has it remained, it's become the dominant theme of Christianity today but now being declared to be the sons of God under the witnessings of the Spirit, we're freed from the servitude of sin. Okay? Listen to me, folks. If you're a Christian, please listen to me. We're freed from the servitude of sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. The first command ever given us in Romans in chapter 6, verse 11 is to reckon ourselves daily to be dead indeed unto sin. Sin shall no longer have any rule over you because you're, why? Because you're not under law, you're under grace. Where there's grace, there's no, God is not imputing men's trespasses against them. There's therefore now no judgment for those of you who are in Christ. We're freed from the servitude of sin. We're also freed from the captivity of Satan where he held us captive. If you don't think that a Christian today can be held captive by Satan, caught in Satan's snares, think again. The greatest threat to your life in Christ is to doubt God's Word, to doubt His promises, and to live your life in such a way as to where you're not trusting Him, which is what He desires the most of us. The greatest thing... I've, I'm gonna, I've suggested this before. I'll say it again. What God desires the most out of you and I is that we trust Him. But 
we're freed not only from the servitude of sin and captivity, captivity of Satan, but particularly from the law. And that spirit of bondage, which it brought upon us, which I've got to suggest is God designed. Nothing happened. It is God who works in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. That is a life-changing fact. If you believe that, your life's going to be one, go one way. If you do not believe that, it's going to go the other. God is truly working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. That includes every mishap, every accident, every act of disobedience, every act of unbelief. God has a purpose in it all. It, ha it hasn't caught Him by surprise. You're no special case with God where that you've, you know, somehow you've gone off the deep end and, well, God can't do anything about it. He's, he's, he's trying to bring you back and, and you won't let Him or whatever the case might be. No, these, these things are God-designed. Why? Because God is sovereign. Supremely sovereign. We don't give God the credit. We don't normally give God the credit that's due Him concerning His sovereignty. Delivered by the spirit of adoption, enabling and, and encouraging us to cry out, Abba, Father, so that we, now, we are now no more under the, the former spirit of slavery that we were formerly under, the spirit of a servant, but a son. Now let me take you back in time. A little bit. Here, here's a young Jewish boy raised. He's a Jew. He's raised as a Jew. His father's obviously a Jew. He's his father's son. He's his father's son. Not, not by any choice that he made. Reminds me of the Passover Beautiful picture of, of the sun. You know, I've, I've mentioned this before. Uh, you know, it's sort of a fictitious little uh, event that I imagined. You know, here you got the little boy. He's, this is Passover. They, they put the blood over the doorposts and the lentils and, and the angel of death is going to pass over, take the firstborn, you know, sons. Uh, he's, he's the firstborn son. Uh, he, uh, his father says, you just, you can, you can sleep peacefully. You don't have to worry. I, I put blood over the doorpost and the lentils. You don't have to worry. You're going to wake up fine. Nothing's going to happen to you. But he doesn't believe God. The kid doesn't believe his father. And he lays awake all night, tossing and turning, tossing and turning all night long, worried about whether he's going to wake up alive right? come morning. It's, it's not dependent upon his belief in the blood that was placed over the doorpost and the lintel. What's important was, did the father place the blood over the doorpost and the lintels? Has nothing to do with the son. Christ redeemed us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. He made us sons. He made us heirs joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ that includes every blessing that He could possibly bestow upon us, which, which are many, many blessings. Too many to mention. It would take a video, just one video, just to even cover. And I still couldn't do it. All the many blessings that we've received in Christ. Grace upon grace. That's vastly different, folks, from those of a servant. The servant doesn't have any interest in his master's affections. The servant of the household, but you've got this little Jewish boy and he's, well, he's wanting to help support his family. And so he, you know, he's hired out as a slave. He goes and works in, a, in a, some master's house as a slave, but he's not a son. The master has a son, but he's not a son. He's a slave. He probably doesn't even sleep in the house. This is the picture that the early Jewish Christians would have gotten from this. 
The, the servant does, has not that interest in his master's affections like the son has, nor that liberty of access to the father like the son has. Think about it. Nor is he fed and clothed as the son is if he's a servant. What he wears is different. What he eats is different. He doesn't, doesn't share in the same privileges as the son. Nor is his obedience performed in the same free, generous manner from a principle of love and gratitude. No, no. It's, but in a servile way. And though, you know, he may expect his wages, he cannot, he can't listen, he cannot hope for an inheritance. And I, nor does he always abide in the house as the son does. Don't make the mistake of thinking that we were formerly not sons and now we are because we were adopted. So we're, you know... Now we're a son of God. We're sons of God, but before we weren't sons of God. That is not true. That's not what the text says. He that is once a son is always a son. And no more a servant. But it makes a difference in how we live. Are we going to live according to the truth concerning who we are? Or are we going to live as people, that, as someone that we're not? As, as someone, live as though we formerly lived even though God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. He that is once a son is always a son. He's no more a servant. Predestination to sonship is immutable. It is God who did the adopting. The child never does the adopting. It's always the father that does the adopting. So we can't stop being a son. Impossible. You cannot, you cannot just, I'll try it sometime. I, 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 well, I, I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't be suggesting that you just go out and try, try to stop being a Christian. Just try to stop reading the Bible. Try to stop praying. Try to stop going to church. Try to, try to just live like the world. You cannot do it if you're a Christian. If you are God's son, there's something in you that says, I can't do that anymore. I can't do that anymore. But what matters is the motivation of your heart. Why are you living the way that you are? Why? To gain God's favor? That's works. That's not grace. Or are you, you living your life in such a way, are, are you doing what you do because you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies? Oh, Steve, obedience brings blessings. No, it does not. It does not. Blessings brings obedience. You've got it turned around. You've put the cart before the horse. You can't stop ever being a son. You can't stop being a child of God. What if, look at what that says about eternal security. Oh, Steve, once saved, always saved. I don't believe that nonsense. Then you haven't studied this book. You're failing miserably, I'm going to say, to understand where God has placed you. He's placed you as a son through adoption. And He's made you a co-heir with Christ. And you have an inheritance. And that inheritance includes everything from the moment you're born again until the end of eternity. And that's not even a phrase you should use. That's the end of eternity. That doesn't even make any sense. That's how far it goes. You're joint heirs with Christ. Everything that God the Father has bestowed upon Christ as a possession belongs to you because you are a co-heir with Christ. And the Lord's coming soon. That ought to excite you to no end. The covenant of grace in which this blessing is secured, folks, is unalterable. Our union with Christ ensures that. It ensures that. 
Now we, as His children, as His sons, we as sons of God, we, we may be corrected, and I shouldn't say may, we are corrected. He corrects every son whom He receives. He chastens every son whom He receives. We may, be, we may be corrected and chastised as we often are in a fatherly way, mind you, but these corrections are proofs for our sonship, our sonship, not against our sonship. And folks, we may, in fact, we judge ourselves unworthy to be called the sons of God. Many Christians do. In fact, I'll go as far as to say I don't think there's ever been a Christian who's ever lived that hasn't at some point in his life done that. We may very, very well, in fact, judge ourselves unworthy. And when we do, the, only, the reason why we do that is because we take our eyes off of Christ. We're supposed to, to focus our, our attention on Him, on Christ and Him above where He's seated at the right hand of God. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. And, and we may at times conclude or at least fear that, that we are not. His sons. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter one bit. You are not redeemed because of how you feel. All right. I'm sorry. I, you know. Well, Steve. I. You know. I don't feel. I don't feel very much like a child of God. I don't feel saved. I'm not sure Christ died in my place. Let me tell you something, folks. If if you are a person, and you are, and this I've always believed this, if you have any concern over whether or not that you are a child of God, if you have any fear, if you have any concern or worry about whether or not you're going to make it to heaven, i got some great news for you. You wouldn't have those feelings if you were not His Son. You would not have those feelings if you did not belong to Him. Those who do not belong to Him don't have those kinds of feelings. And God understands that perfectly. Perfectly. So we may at times conclude that we're not His, but still, the relationship remains. The relationship abides, and it always will. Ever will. We will never more be servants, but always sons. I think the apostle alludes to a custom among the Jews who allowed only free men and not servants and handmaids to call any Abba Father, uh, you know, or uh, it was Ima, mother, Emma, mer mother. That was the tradition. Couldn't do that. You know, as an early Christian Jew, you might have said to your Jewish son, now listen, you, you sit your son down, here, you're a Jew, you, you, you got a Jewish son, you sit him down, and you say, now listen, son, I got something to tell you. Our fathers, though they were redeemed, God, God redeemed us out of, out of bondage, out of the land of Egypt, our fathers became servants again. Yep. Uh, really, Dad? Is that what happened? Yep, son, that's what happened. <laughs> Do you see the parallel, folks? I know you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. But listen to me. Same is true in your case. God redeemed you. And what a price He paid to do that. He redeemed you out of slavery, out of bondage. He took you out of the marketplace, never to be sold again. As a prized possession, He came into this world. He came unto His own. His own received Him not. He died that death that you could not die. He paid that price you could not pay. Yeah, son, our fathers, they were redeemed. They became servants again. But we, now being redeemed, are no longer servants, but heirs. It's 
Same is true in our case. There's nothing new under the sun. Which in a spiritual sense is true of all that are redeemed by Christ. And through that redemption, we receive the adoption of children. And that is what the apostle here, I believe, means. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, which is, which is another benefit arising from adoption, such are the children of God. They are heirs of God Himself. He is their portion. God is our exceeding great reward. Christ is our exceeding great reward. And His perfections, folks, are on our side. And His everything He does in our lives, He, he engages in our lives for our good, our ultimate good. He loves us. Love is the, the giving of oneself for the ultimate good of another, expecting nothing in return. And you, and you think that God expects so much out of you that you don't understand grace. You're His son and you're His heir. You have an inheritance. All of His purposes run the same way. All of His promises belong to us. We are heirs of all the blessings of grace and glory, of righteousness. That's right. You've been made righteous in Christ. You stand before Him holy, unblameable, unreprovable, provable in His sight, Glory, righteousness, life, life, eternal life. Not just, you well, know, Steve, yeah, eternal life. Yeah, that's something we'll have someday. No, no, you don't get it. It is, we have eternal life now. You will never die, okay? You're not, you're not, you're not going anywhere. You might go up for seven years and come back down, but you have eternal life. You will never die. God, just imagine, folks, if we just all if we all just live like that. That is wrong. What's wrong with modern Christianity today? If you can't see that, you're not looking close enough. Life, righteousness, glory, salvation, and a kingdom. We're looking right at it. It's just around the corner. Don't give up now. We'll inherit all things and all through Christ. It's all through Christ. There is no inheritance apart from Christ. He's the grand heir of all things. And we are joint heirs with Him. Our sonship is through Him as is our inheritance which is in His possession. That inheritance is in His possession reserved for us safe, secure in Him. You don't have to worry about that. And by Him and with Him, we will enjoy it. And that is what you have to look forward to. This is the prodigal principle. We, we read the most classic story of it in Luke 15 as Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son. You know, the, the word prodigal, it doesn't appear in the Bible. It just... The, <coughs> <clears throat> it, it means wasteful. That's what it means. Wasteful. You, you wasted your life at some point. God's intervened. God did that. Not you. God did that. He intervened in your life. And now, whether despite what you think, your life is no longer wasteful. Oh, Steve, you don't know what I've done. I'm so tired of hearing that. As if... God somehow just kind of measures your value, your importance on, 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 on well, on how the flesh acts. On, on that which can't be changed. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh is, is the very, one of the very things that you're being redeemed from. That you're being delivered from. Delivered from. The very thing that God is delivering you from. It, the word means wasteful. 
And, and it, it was applied to the story because one, one of the sons wasted his inheritance. No wonder, folks, we are told to redeem the time because the days are evil. God's love for us, God's love for you, God's love for me, and His willingness to forgive us no matter what we've done. Over 2,000 videos now and counting, I don't know, 2,200 something. I posted to Facebook just the other day. It was YouTube that informed me that, you know, uh, there's been something like 22,000 plus uh, videos ago that I first hit the upload button. And folks, a lot of that's been prophecy, but a lot of that has been teaching. This is a grace ministry first and foremost. I want to tell you how much all of you, I, we appreciate you. You've been the greatest, bless, single greatest blessing, listen, in my life, in Sue's life. That's saying a lot. You have been that. You have, if you think this ministry has blessed you, let me tell you, it goes just the other way around too. You have blessed us in a way that I could never describe. And most of you, I've never met you. It's hard for me to even get some of you to post a profile picture so I can just see what you look like. You mean so much to us. Look, rest in Him, dearly beloved. Rest in Him. Trust in Him. This is what He desires the most from us. We're going home soon. Join us on Wednesday as we study through some topic, whatever the Lord brings to, to the table. I ask for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. As, as we draw closer and closer, this, you know, this, this day here, we're just one day closer. And as we draw closer and closer to, the, to our Lord's return, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more excited every day. I, I, I really am. I, because I know we're going home soon and I know I will see each one of you very soon. Until next time, this is Steve. We love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. Thanks for watching.